Welcome. We are on chapter 15. I'm sorry, but not sorry. It has taken me a while to get to this chapter, y'all. I'm so busy. Do any of you guys feel like I'm so busy and not busy at the same time? Yeesh. And this is drama filled. The plot thickens. Here we go. Chapter 15. Mr. Rochester did, on a future occasion, explain it. It was one afternoon when he chanced to meet me in Adele in the grounds, and while he played with Pilot and her shuttlecock, he asked me to walk up and down a long beach avenue within sight of her. He then said that she was the daughter of a French opera dancer, Céline Varance, towards whom he had once cherished what he called a grand passion. This passion Céline had professed to return with even superior ardour. He thought himself her idol, ugly as he was. He believed, as he said, and she preferred his taille d'athlète to the elegance of the Apollo Belvedere. And, monsieur, so much was I flattered by this preference of the Gaelic sylph for her British gnome that I installed her in a hotel gave her a complete establishment of servants, a carriage, cashmeres, diamonds, dentils, etc. In short, I began the process of ruining myself in the received style, like any other spoony. I had not, it seems, the originality to chalk out a new road to shame and destruction, but trod the old track with stupid exactness. Not to deviate an inch from the beat and centre. I had, as I deserved to have, the fate of all other spoonies. Having to call one evening when Celine had not inspected me, I found her out. That it was a warm night, and I was tired of strolling through Paris, so I sat down in her boudoir, happy to breathe the air consecrated so lately by her presence. Uh, No, I exaggerate. I never thought there was any consecrating virtue about her. It was rather a sort of pastille perfume she had. A scent of musk and amber, than an odour of sanctity. I was just beginning to stifle the fumes of conservatory flowers and sprinkled essences when I bethought myself to open the window and step out onto the balcony. It was moonlight, the gaslight besides, and very still and serene. The balcony was furnished with a chair or two. I sat down, took out a cigar, and... I will take one out now, if you'll excuse me. Here ensued a pause, filled up by the producing and lighting of a cigar, having placed it to his lips and breathed a trail of Havana incense on the freezing and sunless air. He went on. I liked bonbons, too, in those days, Miss Eyre. I was croquant, overlooked the barbarism, croquant chocolat confits, and smoking alternately, watching meantime the equipages that rolled along the fashionable streets towards the neighbouring opera house, when in an elegant close carriage, drawn upon by a beautiful pair of English horses, and distinctly seen in the brilliant city night, I recognised the boutoir I had given Celine. She was returning, of course. My heart thumped with impatience against the iron rails I leant upon. The carriage stopped, as I had expected, at the hotel door. My flame, for that is the very word for an opera immorata, alighted, though muffed in a cloak, an unnecessary encumbrance, by the by, on so warm a January, so warm a June evening. I knew her instantly by her little foot, soon peeping from the skirt of a dress as she skipped from the carriage step. Bending over the balcony, I was about to murmur, Mommage, in a tone, of course, which should be audible to the ear of love alone, when a figure jumped out from the carriage after her, cloaked also, but what had a spurred heel which had rung on the pavement, and that was a hatted head that now passed under the arched port chauquer of the hotel. 
Do you never feel jealousy, Miss Eyre? Of course not. I need not ask you, because you never felt love. You have both sentiments, but yet to experience them. Your soul sleeps. All shock is yet to be given which shall waken it. You think all existence lapses in as quiet a flow as that in which your youth has hitherto slid away, floating on with closed eyes and muffled ears. You neither see the rocks bristling not far off in the bed of the flood, nor hear the breakers boil at their base. But I tell you, you may mark my words. You will come some day to a craggy pass in the channel, where the whole of life's stream will be broken up into the whirl and tumult, foam and noise. Either you will be dashed to atoms on the crag points, or lifted up and borne on by some master wave into a calmer current as I am now. I like this day. I like that sky of steel. I like the sternness and stillness of the world under this frost. I like Thornfield, its antiquity, its retirement, its old crow trees and thorn trees, its grey facade, the lines of dark windows reflecting that metal welkin. And yet how long have I abhorred the very thought of it? Shunned it like a great plague house. How I do still abhor. <laughs> he ground his teeth and was silent. He rested his step and struck his boot hard against the ground. Some hated thought seemed to have him in its grip and to hold him so tightly that he could not advance. We were ascending the avenue when he thus paused. The hall was before us. Lifting its eye to his battlements, he cast over them a glare such as I never saw before or since. Pain, shame, ire, impatience, disgust, detestation, seemed momentarily to hold a quivering conflict in a large pupil dilating under his ebon eyebrow. <clears throat> Wild was the wrestle which should be paramount, but another feeling rose and triumphed. Something hard and cynical, self-willed and resolute. It settled his passion and petrified his countenance. He went on. During the moment I was silent, Miss Eyre, I was arranging a point with my destiny. She stood there, by that beech trunk, a hag like one of those who appeared to make Beth on the heath of forest. You like Thornfield? she said, lifting a finger, and then she wrote in the air a memento which ran in lurid hieroglyphs all along the front of the house, between the upper and lower rows of windows. Like it if you can, like it if you dare. I will like it, said I. I dare like it. And, he subjoined moodily, I will keep my word. It will break obstacles to happiness, to goodness. Yes, goodness, I wish to be a better man than I have been, than I am, as Job's Levithian broke the spear, the dart, the hairburgeon, hindrances which others count as iron and brass, I will esteem but straw and rotten wood. Adele here ran before him with her shuttlecock. Away, he cried harshly. Keep at a distance, child, or go into the sofa. Continuing then to pursue his walk in silence, I ventured to recall him to the point whence he had abruptly diverged. Did you leave the balcony, sir? I asked, when Mademoiselle Varence entered. I almost expected a rebuff for this hardly well timed to question, but on the contrary, walking out of his scowling, abstraction he turned his eyes towards me and the shade seemed to clear off his brow <laughs> oh i had forgotten celine well to resume when i saw my charmer thus coming accompanied by cavalier i seemed to hear a hiss and the green snake of jealousy 
rising on undulating coils from the moonlit balcony, glided within my waistcoat and ate its way in two minutes into my heart's core. Strange! he exclaimed, suddenly starting again from the point. Strange that I should choose you for the confidant of all this, young lady. Passing. Strange that you should listen to me quietly, as if it were the most usual thing in the world for a man like me to tell stories of his opera mistresses to a quaint, inexperienced girl like you. But the last singularity explains the first, as I intimated once before, you with your gravity. Considerateness and caution were made to be the recipient of secrets. Besides, I know what sort of mind I have placed in the communication with my own. I know it is one not liable to take infection. It is a peculiar mind. It is a unique one. Happily, I do not mean to harm it, but if I did, it would not take harm from me. The more you and I converse, the better. For while I cannot blight you, you may refresh me. After this digression, he proceeded. I remained in the balcony. They will come to here, to her boudoir, no doubt, thought I. Let me prepare an ambush. So putting my hand in through the open window, I drew the curtain over it, leaving only an opening through which I could make all observations. Then I closed the casement all but a chink just wide enough to furnish an outlet to the lover's whispered vows. Then I stole back to my chair, and as I resumed it, the pair came in. My eye was quickly at the aperture. Celine's chambermaid entered, lit a lamp, left it on the table, and withdrew. The couple were thus revealed to me clearly. Both removed their cloaks, and there was the Varans shining in a satin and jewels, my gifts, of course, and there was a companion in an officer's uniform, and I knew him for a young row of Vicomte, a brainless and vicious youth whom I had sometimes met in society and had never thought of hating because I despised him so absolutely. On recognising him, the fang of jealousy was instantly broken. Because at the very same moment my lover, Celine, sank under an extinguisher. A woman who could betray me for such a rival was not worth contending for. She deserved only scorn. Less, however, than I, who had been her dupe. They began to talk. The conversation eased me completely. Frivolous, mercenary heartless and senseless it was rather calculated to weary than enrage a listener a card of mine lay on the table this being perceived brought my name under discussion neither of them possessed energy or wit to bellable me soundly but they insulted me as coarsely as they could in the little way especially Celine, who even waxed rather brilliant on my personal defects deformities she termed them now i had been her custom to launch out into fervent admiration of what she called my beaute moile wherein she differed diametrically from you who told me point blank at the second interview that you did not think me handsome the contrast struck me much at the time and adele came running up late Monsieur John has been here to say that your agent has called and wishes to see you. Ah, in that case I must abridge. Opening the window, I walked in upon them, liberated Celine from my protection, gave her notice to vacate the hotel, offered her a purse for immediate exigencies, regarded, disregarded screams, hysterics, prayers, protestations, convulsions made an appointment with the Vicomte for a meeting at the Bouge de Boulogne. Next morning, I had the pleasure of encountering him with a bullet in one of his poor, etilated arms, feeble as the wing of a chicken on the pip, and then thought I had done with the whole crew. But unluckily, the Varan six months before had given me this fillet, Adele, who she affirmed was my daughter. 
Mm, perhaps she may be, though I see no proofs of such grim paternity written on her countenance. Pilot is more like me than she. Some years after I had broken with the mother, she abandoned a child, ran away to Italy with a musician or singer. I acknowledged no natural claim on Adele's part to be supported by me, nor do I now acknowledge any, for I am not a father, but hearing that she was quite destitute. I even took the poor thing out of slime and mud of Paris and transplanted her here to grow up clean in the wholesome soil of an English country garden. Mrs. Fairfax found you to train it, but now you know that it is the illegitimate offspring of a French opera girl. You will perhaps think differently of your post and protégé. You will be coming to see me some day with the notice that you have found another place, that you beg to me to look out for a new governess. Eh? No, Adele is not answerable for either her mother's faults or yours. I have a regard for her, and now that I know she is, in a sense, parentless, forsaken by her mother, and disowned by you, sir, I shall cling closer to her than before. How could I possibly prefer the spoiled pet of a wealthy family who would hate a governess as a nuisance to a lonely little orphan who leans towards you as a friend. Oh. That is the light in which you view it. Well, I must go in now. And you too, it darkens. But I stayed out a few minutes longer with Adele and Pilot, ran a race with her, and played a game of battle door and shuttlecock. When we went in, and I had removed her bonnet and coat, I took her on my knee, kept her there an hour, allowing her to prattle as she liked, not rebuking even some of the little freedoms and trivialities into which she was apt to stray when much noticed, and which betrayed in her a superficiality of character, inherited probably from her mother, hardly congenial to an English mind. Still she had her merits, and I was disposed to appreciate all that was good in her to the utmost. I sought in her countenance and features a likeness to Mr. Rochester, but found none. No trait, no turn of expression announced relationship. It was a pity. If she could but have been proved to resemble him, he would have thought more of her. It was not till after I had withdrawn to my own chamber for the night that I steadily reviewed the tale Mr. Rochester had told me. As he had said, there was probably nothing at all extraordinary in the substance of the narrative itself. A wealthy Englishman's passion for a French dancer, and her treachery to him, were every day matters enough, no doubt, in society. But there was something decidedly strange in the paroxysm of emotion which had suddenly seized him when he was in the act of expressing the present contentment of his mood and his newly revived pleasure in the old hall and his environs. I meditated, wonderingly on this incident, but gradually quitting it, as I found it for the present inexplicable. I turned to the consideration of my master's manner to myself. The confidence he had thought fit to repose in me seemed to tribute it to my discretion. I regarded and accepted it as such. His deportment had now for some weeks been more uniform toward me than at first. I never seemed in his way. He did not take fits of chilling hauteur. When we had met unexpectedly, the encounter seemed welcome. He had always a word and sometimes a smile for me. When summoned by formal invitation to his presence, I was honoured by a cordiality of reception that made me feel I really possessed the power to amuse him, and that this evening conferences were sought as much for his pleasure as for my benefit. I indeed talked comparatively little, but I heard him talk with relish. It was his nature to be communicative. He liked to open to a mind acquaint unacquainted with the world glimpses of its scenes and ways, I do not mean its corrupt scenes in wicked ways, but such as derived their interest from the great scale on which they were acted, the strange novelty by which they were characterized, 
and I had a keen delight in receiving the new ideas he offered, in imagining the new pictures he portrayed, in following him in thought through the new regions he disclosed, never startled or troubled by one noxious illusion. The ease of his manner freed me from painful restraint. A friendly frankness, as correct as cordial, with which he treated me drew me to him. I felt at times as if he were my relation rather than my master, yet he was imperious sometimes still, but I did not mind that. I saw it was his way. So happy, so gratified did I become with this new interest added in life, that I ceased to pine after kindred. My thin, crescent destiny seemed to enlarge. The blanks of existence were filled up. My bodily health improved. I gathered flesh and strength. And was Mr. Rochester now ugly in my eyes? No, reader. Gratitude and many associations, all pleasurable and genial, made his face the object I best liked to see. His presence in a room was more cheering than the brightest fire. Yet had I had not forgotten his faults, indeed, I could not, for he thought them frequently before me. He was proud, sardonic, harsh, and to inferiority of every description. In my secret soul I knew that his great kindness to me was balanced by unjust severity to many others. He was moody, too, unaccountably so. I, more than once, when sent for him to read, found him sitting in his library alone, with his head bent on his folded arms, and when he looked up, a morose, almost a malignant scowl blackened his features. But I believed that his moodiness, his harshness, and his former faults of morality, I say former for now, he seemed corrected of them, had their source in some cruel course of fate, I believed he was naturally a man of better tendencies, higher principles and purer tastes than such as circumstances had developed, education instilled, or destiny encouraged. I thought that there were excellent materials in him, though for the present they hung together somewhat spoiled and tangled. I cannot deny that I grieved for his grief, whatever that was, and would have given much to assuage it. Though I had now extinguished my candle and was laid down in bed, I could not sleep for thinking of his look when he paused in the avenue and told how his destiny had risen up before him and dared him to be happy at Thornfield. Why not? I asked myself. What alienates him from seldom being stayed here? Will he leave it again soon? Mrs. Fairfax says he doesn't stay here longer than a fortnight at a time, and he has now been resident eight weeks. If he does go, the change will be doleful. Suppose he should be absent spring, summer, and autumn. How joyless sunshine and fine days will seem. I hardly know whether I had slept or not after this musing. At any rate, I started wide awake on hearing a vague murmur, peculiar, and lugubrious, which sounded, I thought, just above me. I wished I had kept my candle burning. The night was drearily dark. My spirits were depressed. I rose and sat up in bed, listening. The sound was hushed. I tried again to sleep, but my heart beat anxiously. My inward tranquillity was broken. The clock far down in the hall struck two, just then it seemed my chamber door was touched, as if fingers had swept the panels in groping away along the dark gallery outside. I said, Who is there? Nothing answered. I was chilled with fear. All at once I remembered that it might be Pilot, who when the kitchen door chanced to be left open, not unfrequently found his way up to the threshold of Mr. Rochester's chamber. I had seen him lying there myself in the mornings. The idea calmed me somewhat. I lay down. Silence composes the nerves, and as an unbroken hush now reigned again under through the house, I began to feel the return of slumber. 
but it was not fated that I should sleep that night. A dream had scarcely approached my ear when it fled affrighted, scared by a marrow freezing incident enough. This was a demonic laugh, low, suppressed, and deep, uttered as it seemed at the very keyhole of my chamber door. The head of my bed was near the door, and I thought at first the goblin laughter stood at my bedside, or rather crouched by my pillow. But I rose, looked around, and could see nothing. While as I still gazed, the unnatural sound was reiterated, and I knew it came from behind the panels. My first impulse was to rise and fasten the bolt, my next again to cry out, Who is there? Something gurgled and moaned. Ere long, steps retreated up the gallery towards the third-story staircase. A door had lately been made to shut in that staircase. I heard it open and close, and all was still. Was that Grace Poole? And is she possessed with a devil? thought I. Impossible now to remain longer by myself. I must go to Mrs. Fairfax. I hurried on my frock and shawl. I withdrew the bolt and opened the door with a trembling hand. There was a candle burning just outside, and on the matting in the gallery. I was surprised at the circumstance, but still more was I amazed to perceive the air quite dim, as if filled with smoke. And, while looking to the right hand and left, to find whence these blue wreaths issued, I became further aware of a strong smell of burning. Something creaked. It was a door ajar, and that door was Mr. Rochester's, and the smoke rushed in a cloud from thence. I thought no more of Mrs. Fairfax. I thought no more of Grace Poole or the laugh. In an instant I was within the chamber. Tongues of flame darted round the bed. The curtains were on fire. In the midst of blaze and vapour, Mr. Rochester lay stretched, motionless, in deep sleep. Wake! Wake! I cried. I shook him, but he only murmured and turned. The smoke had stupefied him. Not a moment could be lost. The very sheets were kindling. I rushed to his basin and knew a... Fortunately, one was wide and the other deep, and both were filled with water. I heaved them up, deluged the bed in its occupant, flew back to my own room, brought my own water jug, baptised the couch afresh, and, by God's aid, succeeded in extinguishing the flames which were devouring it. The hiss of the quenched element, the breaking of a pitcher which I had flung from my hand when I had emptied it, and, above all, the splash of the shower bath I had liberally bestowed roused Mr. Rochester at last. Though it was now dark, I knew he was awake because I heard him fulminating strange anathemes at finding himself lying in a pool of water. Is there a flood? he cried. No, sir, I answered. But there has been a fire. Get up. Do you are quenched now? I will fetch you a candle. In the name of all the elves of Christendom, is that Jane Eyre? he demanded. What have you done with me, witch? Sorceress? Who is in the room besides you? Have you plotted to drown me? 